tremendous progress been made in the treatment of mental illness. Not only do the doctors know more, but the public who has become perhaps the most rapid and impressive progress has been made in the development of new drugs, which give new hope in the treatment of dangerous and serious conditions like depression. No one would suspect that this newspaper story of eight months ago could have been written about him. An apparently crazed man attempted to murder his wife and child and take his own Montreal home Thursday. This is the same man. He is today working and living as normal a life as any of us. But in a moment you're going to see him as he was eight months ago, just after that newspaper story was published. He had just been admitted to Verdun Protestant Hospital, where the record reads, onset of this attack about August 4th, after grip with depression. August 11th, threatened to kill excess amount of pills. August 15th, said he must kill his wife and to do so next morning. The report on admission reads, the whole face leaves one with the impression of a sad mask. What do you think will happen to you? As I still say, I think that they'll, they'll hang me for this. For what you've done? For what I've done, yes. Well, you haven't done anything that you could be hanged for. Well, I tried to attempt to murder my wife and child. This is the policeman who was rushed to the scene eight months ago. We had a call about a complaint. And as we arrived on the scene, there were some people standing out, telling us to hurry because there was a man trying to kill his wife. So we went running up. As we opened the door, we saw a woman with an injury with her right ha eyes. And she had blood all coming, coming over her dress and everything. And she had difficulty to walk. So we put her in the bed. And look at the baby. He had a little cut over his head, but nothing was serious. So I came back. What did she say? She told us to look at her husband in the kitchen. He was dying. So we went in the kitchen. And he had some cut over the, the chest and some uh, under the neck. And near him, there was a knife about six inches long, all covered with blood. What did he say? He told us that he didn't want to die to help him, that uh, he didn't want to die. Dr. Breen Marion was the surgeon who looked after the patient in the operating room of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. He was covered in blood. He had multiple lacerations of his forehead and his neck and his face. But the more serious injuries were the multiple puncture wounds uh, in his left chest. What about his wife? To his wife, who, by the way, was pregnant, seven months pregnant at that time. Was she badly damaged? She was not seriously injured. Uh, however, we were quite worried about the pregnancy, mm -hmm. whether any injury had uh, occurred to uh, the, the child. But her injuries were mainly soft tissue injuries. There were no fractures. She had been beaten severely about the head and uh, about the eyes. How badly was he injured? He was very badly injured. Uh, he uh, had 20 stab wounds in his left chest and had missed his heart uh, more by good fortune than by design. You're convinced he, that he really meant to hit it? He certainly did. Uh, the area of the wounds were more or less centered around the heart, but he had managed to puncture his lung uh, on at least two of these wounds, and he developed an air leak in one lung with considerable hemorrhage in the lung as well. I should certainly think that he would not have survived had he not been brought to hospital within two or three hours. Well, what about his attitude? Well, his attitude was certainly one of complete and utter dejection and depression and guilt. He kept repeating to the nurses and to myself that this was the end, he wanted to die, uh, he had done a dreadful thing. He was quite aware of everything that he had uh, done. Did he uh, make any further attempts? About two days after he was admitted, he tried once more. He warned us that he would try. We had Did you believe him? We believed him and we had police in his room uh, on 24-hour duty. Uh, but he still managed to get a hold of uh, a glass 
which he broke and I believe tried to uh, swallow the glass. When did you send him away? He left here on about the sixth day, by which time his collapsed lung had um, uh, re-expanded and we had removed the drain from his lung cavity and taken all the sutures out and I think there were about a hundred stitches inserted for the multiple wounds that he had inflicted upon himself and he was sent by ambulance on the sixth day to Verdun Protestant Hospital. We see the patient on the ward talking to Dr. Henry de Rost. Well, I'm feeling very, very sad, very bad about everything that happened. It's a crazy, crazy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Anyone with their, in their right mind wouldn't be doing it. What do you feel now? Well, I feel that that I did wrong. I tried to commit suicide and attempted murder on my wife and child. That's a terrible thing to do. Why, why did you attempt murder on your wife and child? Well, I figured she was she was so unhappy, and I figured would, the easy way out would be that to kill my wife and child and and kill myself. And that way we'd all be, all go through, uh, out of the misery together. But it's a, it's a wrong thing I know to do. A wrong thing, but you felt it was the only thing? I felt it was the only thing, yes. Mm -hmm. What is your feeling now? My feeling is, well, how am I supposed to feel right now? I'm so, so worried about everything and, and feel so bad about it all that I'm nothing in, in the world could ever, could ever make me feel different now. I just feel that I'm not even happy no more. This is the man who, in a state of clear consciousness, tried to kill two other people and himself. Why? Do you have any feelings of love for anybody now? For love? Yeah. Right there now, I have no feelings for, just seeing for no one. Since this has happened, I've often wondered if, if my ch child and wife still live I've heard and I've been hearing things and saying that, hearing sounds saying your son's dead, your son's dead. And, and they say your, your wife's dead. How am I supposed to believe? Well, they are both alive and they're both quite well. Are you able to believe that? No, I'm not. I still, still, still don't believe it. Mm -hmm. So I wish, if I really knew they were both well, it'd, it'd be great. But the oh, world well, looks pretty grim ahead. It looks as if. I'll hang for this. In fact, I know I will. Has anybody told you that you will? No one has told me, no. But there seems to be no more hope left, no. It seems that every, the world is all against me now. You've tried to take your own life since that time, since you went to hospital. Yes, I, I did. Why did you do that? Because I figured the same thing. I figured my wife and, and child was, was dead. So I figured what's the use of living? If, there, if I lost my wife and child, I had a great, great little boy.
nice little boy. Eleven months old, he's the dearest little thing that you could ever wish for. You, in the last week or so, you really felt, though, that you didn't want to live. I had taken sleeping pills and things to, because I'd worried so much about the whole affair. Did you take a lot of them? I took a, quite a few. I wouldn't say, couldn't say how many. But this was quite a, quite a dose off them. Why did you take them? Well, I figured they'd make me sleep, or I, I, at the time, I didn't know. I felt sad. I felt like doing away with myself. Did you want to die then? In my heart, no. I, I didn't want to die, but I figured maybe I'd pass away and like that it'd, it'd be an easy way out. Did you ask anybody for help at mm. that time? No. So my wife called my brother and said that I should that he should come down. But I slept for two days. I don't oh, know. But anyway he cheered me up and said everything will come along all right, don't worry, just keep your head up. Did you believe me? Chin up, but I figured no, I figured I couldn't manage everything. The baby didn't seem to care for me even. He seemed to be Did you think me. anybody cared for you at that time? No. Yeah, I figured not, but what about treatment for the way you're feeling now? The way I'm feeling now, it's... Well... Just have to cheer up and... Take it on, and take and leave things go as it come, as, as they come, and... Never mind worrying about every little thing that's, that's to come. What about right now? Do, do you feel that what's happening to you and the way you feel is a form of sickness? I don't know how you would... I would say... in a form of sickness, yes, but... Not a sickness that can be cured? No, you got to cure it yourself. That's the only only thing, solution, I can see. That's what most of us think when we consider our emotions and their effect on us. You've got to cure it yourself. But let's see what the doctors can do for a depression like this. With the new drugs and with ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Well, now that he's been admitted to hospital, which I feel is essential for treatment of a man as sick as this patient is, we will put him on one of the antidepressant drugs probably for four or five days. And during that time, of course, he'll need very close observation to prevent further suicidal efforts. Which you expect. Which we certainly expect, because this man has already attempted, made an attempt on his own life at least three times within the last two days. And we have every reason to expect that he would continue to do this. These new drugs, how do they work? Well, they seem to work on the central nervous system, probably in the brain stem and the hypothalamus. <clears throat> because we don't know or are not very clear yet about the etiology of these conditions, we can't really say exactly how they work. They work at a chemical level, a physiological level, but exactly what's happening we really don't know yet. Well, is, is it safe to use treatments uh, when you don't know really what is happening? I would say so. They've now been used on thousands and thousands of people without any ill effects, and we feel that even though we don't know exactly the mechanism of their function, we're certainly justified in using them. We don't know the mechanism and function of ECT, but we've saved, or there have many lives been saved by the use of a treatment of this kind because so many suicides have been prevented. And how does it work with them? What does it do to them? The suicidal impulses, this feeling of extreme guilt, of there being no future for the individual, simply disappear. They're gone from the consciousness, this feeling of sadness and depression and, and so on uh, just evaporates. So even with this tragic, background of the last few days, the outlook for him still has some hope. Oh, I would say it's excellent. I mean, this this is, is really one condition in which treatment is very effective.
quite dramatic. The patient feels well in a very short time, and, and these symptoms simply don't come back. We keep them on drugs for months, sometimes even years, and follow the patient either here at the hospital in our aftercare clinic or refer them back to their general practitioner or to an outside psychiatrist. It's certainly possible that at some time, maybe in a few years, this patient may again become sick. But with present follow-up techniques in psychiatry, it's quite easy to keep in contact with a patient who's had an illness of this kind and therefore detect early symptoms and, and prevent their recurrence. This bright outlook of eight months ago was fully justified with our patient, as we'll see in a moment. But first, let's look at the whole mental illness situation with Dr. Durost. What's the meaning of the term psychosis? Well, we tend to differentiate the psychosis from the more minor forms of mental disorder, which generally are called psychoneuroses. The psychotic patient shows a much more all-embracing disorder. This may involve his capacity to think clearly, he may become confused, his capacity to differentiate between the reality of the world around him and the delusions or fantasies that may be occupying his mind becomes quite defective. What causes a psychosis? Well, a psychosis is caused on the one hand probably by factors which are inherited from the parents, genetic factors, some kind of a predisposition to become sick in this particular way. And when you combine that with experiences, stressful, emotionally stressful experiences to which the patient is exposed, the two together seem to combine to produce an illness which is of major proportions which we call a psychosis. There are very many patterns of breakdown. Psychosis is simply one. Can you tell a man who's going to break down in one of these various ways? There are certain personality deviations within the normal range which suggest a tendency to break down in a particular kind of way. Schizoid personalities may be more liable to develop schizophrenic illnesses. Knowing this, is it possible to uh, take a course of action that will prevent the breakdown or impede it? It's hypothetically possible, but life living today is such a complex thing that to set out to control all, all the possible factors that can produce a breakdown is almost a hopeless task. One might, perhaps, if one saw an individual who was obviously breaking down or showing signs of an impending break, perhaps remove them from the stressful situation and thereby avert an attack, which was almost on the threshold. But from a long-range point of view, we just don't know enough. What are the possibilities of curing these various conditions now, Dr. DeRust? The mental hospital population is gradually dropping, which is one pretty objective indicator that of success in treatment. Is this because of drugs, principally? Drugs, the fact that the drugs have made it possible to treat these patients in a much more constructive way in terms of having them uh, occupied in activities, work therapy, industrial workshops, occupational therapy, psychodrama. The hospitals are now almost entirely open, and the problem of violent, disturbed behavior is virtually gone, except for isolated instances. And this creates a new milieu in which you can treat a patient probably very much more effectively than in the past when your main problem was keeping the patient sedated out of difficulties, not breaking the windows or something like that, which now simply very rarely occurs. Two months after our depressed patient's admission to Verdun Protestant Hospital, the record reads, his outlook is good. However, in view of the patient's illness prior to his admission, it's essential that he remain in hospital for an adequate convalescent period. Three weeks later, it reads, patient's wife has had her baby and will be discharged from Queen Elizabeth Hospital tomorrow. Three days later, the patient went home on trial. He came back to hospital a couple of times. His condition needed stabilizing. Now, that was three months ago. Here he is now at the hospital clinic where he comes for his checkup and to renew his supply of drugs. It's uh, eight months now since we first saw you here and first filmed you here. Oh, that's right. You're not the same man. No, I don't feel the same, I don't think. I feel much, much better now. At least I hope I... I think I look better than what I did then, too. Well, I think you do, too. He's You're like, working. Yeah, yeah, I'm back to work. And I got the nose to the grindstone, as usual. So, everything's going fine. But how do you feel about things now? Well, I feel much better. I think my husband is pretty much back to normal now. 
Can we have to just reach out again, which I couldn't do a few months back? Well, we have we have a few children of our own, and we're mainly interested in giving them a good life, try to bring them up, and we're looking forward to their their manhood. So uh, we have no time to think about ourselves no more. And what difference has it made to you now, having been sick and been in the hospital? Well, I learned that you can be cured. And and don't wait. To, if you see that your something's going wrong, well, don't keep it inside yourself. I used to get in a tight corner and by myself and worry and think about this and that. Never discussed mm -hmm. anything with my wife or any of my friends. It's like someone has something wrong with them physically, then they realize they can go to a doctor. Now, having been sick, you realize that there's something as being mentally ill or emotionally ill. It's something that you go to a doctor for, for treatment. Well, you sure. Sure, I was mm -hmm. mentally sick. That's mm -hmm. all there was to it. There was no sickness. There was nothing wrong with me physically. I know it now. This but was something time, you didn't realize. At I the didn't time. realize. No, at the mm -hmm. time, no. And what about you? You know, I didn't realize it because I never had any case like that. I never saw much of mentally illness at all. So. And you really wouldn't have any reason to know that your husband was sick then any more than he would. Well, looking back on it now. What kind of things do you think you might have recognized if you had known what to look for in your husband as he was getting sick? Well, I'd say again, like any change in his normal health. But what, what did you see? Well, that he couldn't sleep and didn't want to eat, no interest in anything. You mean he really stopped eating or what, what happened? Oh, yes, he said he had no appetite. He didn't actually stop eating. But he mm -hmm. He didn't care for any food. He didn't care if he saw any or he didn't. He lost interest in a number in of anything, things. In anything, in anything, really. Mm -hmm. What about working? Uh, oh, he wouldn't walk at a time either, and he felt like that. He didn't care for any walk at all. And the kids? Not even the kids. Didn't want to talk to the kids even, or, or smile, or nothing at no. all. He just wanted to be alone, just mm -hmm. wanted to be left alone. And what seems to happen in some people that this, these normal worries build up and build up and build up until, well, what we call a breakdown occurs. And then all your capacity to deal with all of these things just disappears and, and you sink way down and feel the way you did before you came into the hospital the first time. What's important now is that these are indications and, and your wife has a, a pretty good idea of what kind of things to look for. There are, these, these are safeguards because when you go home, from the hospital after having been so sick. Of course, we're concerned about the situation, your wife is concerned, and you're concerned, and your friends are, in, and so on, mm -hmm. so that we have safeguards, as it were. I mean, your wife knows what to look for, You've, you have a good idea of what to look for, you're taking medications, and you come to see us. So mm -hmm. that, uh, it actually, in four ways, the whole the situation is covered. Yes, so it doesn't need to build up and up and up and up until it uh, no. breaks. No, Th things are well under control mm -hmm. this way. Well, I can tell myself if I'm, uh, if I was getting sick again. I know right away. And you know. Oh, yes, I sure know now. So here is a man living in most respects like any of us, and the outlook for the future is good. There's enough understanding and elasticity in the law so that he has not been prosecuted for attempted murder and attempted suicide. He was sick. Attempts of this kind, particularly suicide, are quite frequently encountered with depressions. Our patient's surgeon, Dr. Marion, has had some experience and has some thoughts on this matter. The majority of them survive with uh, surgery, uh, immediate surgery, and they are then sent to an institution for the treatment of their mental illness, which caused this suicide. And then they, um, many of them, return to useful activity in this society. Do you know people who have done that? I do. I know of three patients uh, who are patients of mine at the present time who were attempted suicides 25 years ago and since have had no further uh, mental illness of any serious nature, have led productive, happy lives, raised families, educated their children. And so I would estimate that other surgeons must also have encountered patients who were previously attempted suicides. Any idea how many suicides there are in a city like Montreal in a year? Well, the coroner's statistics which were published in the paper just a few days ago uh, drew my attention mainly because uh, I was interested in this problem 
as you are. And I was surprised to find that um, of traffic accidents, of which we make a great deal of um, publicity and efforts to control it, there were 130, approximately 130 traffic deaths in the Montreal area, and there were 160 successful suicides, which uh, for every successful suicide, there may well be one or two unsuccessful ones, fortunately, who are treated so that the suicide rate would appear to be very much more common than we like to believe. Suicide is too often the ugly end of a depression which has gone unrecognized and untreated. 